Hi everyone, this is Caroline Griffin. Um, I am the Events and Operations Manager for Riot. Um, I would like to thank everyone for joining us today. And I will go ahead and introduce John Breitenbach, who is a Field Applications Engineering Manager for Real-Time Innovations. RTI has been a longtime sponsor of Riot, and John in particular has been a great supporter of Riot. So we're very lucky and happy to have him with us today. Um, I'll just remind everyone that I will be monitoring the questions um, and we will take all questions at the end. So um, thank you for joining us. And without further ado, I'll let John take it away. Thanks, Caroline. Uh, again, my name is John Breitenbach. Uh, I am a FAE manager for Real-Time Innovations, Inc., uh, which basically means that I spend my days trying to help our customers uh, build the industrial Internet of Things. And we're going to talk about uh, today uh, some of the ways that we do that and some of the guidance that um, we give them, uh, specifically from actually a, an outside organization called the Industrial Internet Consortium. Uh, and as Caroline said, RTI uh, is very much uh, focused on industrial Internet of Things, which is one of the reasons that we have been a longtime supporter of Riot um, and everything that they do. We love working with the Riot folks. So thanks for having us today, Caroline. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we are going to talk today um, about the industrial Internet of Things. And we really think of, when we think of IoT, RTI's view of the world is that we really see sort of two different IoTs. There's the consumer IoT, which is represented by some of the things that you see on the left, um, things like your, your Nest thermostat and your Apple Watch and soccer balls that can tell how, how hard you kick them. Uh, and then there's the industrial Internet of Things. And this is all the big spinning things that keep the world running and keep the lights on. It's things like connected transportation, connected energy, uh, future connected healthcare. And that's the area that we're going to be talking about today. We're really focusing on these sort of uh, industrial large scale applications rather than the sort of, hey, I want to connect my thermostat to the Internet. And while the consumer internet gets 80% of the hype, the World Economic Forum actually uh, estimates that 80% of the value of the Internet of Things is really uh, in applications in the industrial Internet of Things. And if we look at uh, the reason for that, I mean, this is just a small sampling of the many, many, many different industry segments and vertical markets that are touched by the ind industrial Internet of Things. And this is a uh, a much abbreviated list. This doesn't account for new things like autonomous cars, um, uh, worldwide pandemic response, and a number of other uh, new technologies. But this is a partial list that is provided by the Industrial Internet Consortium. Um, and this is going to have uh, a multi-trillion dollar impact across uh, all industries, uh, basically. Um, when you look at the disruption that happened with the Internet, uh, the Internet disrupted a lot of uh, industries, um, certainly things like video distribution. We no longer have to go to a blockbuster store. We have Netflix and, um, and Apple TV uh, and things like that. Um, the music industry was totally changed by it. Travel agents went out of business. We all book our own travel now. But there are a lot of industries that were not touched by the Internet, revolu uh, the internet uh, revolution and the disruption that it caused. Um, but that's going to change with the IoT. Um, so industries like medicine, uh, really, which weren't all that impacted by the Internet, it didn't really change the way that patients were treated, uh, didn't really change our experiences. That is going to change uh, in the coming years. Um, and it's going to change because we're going to create new value. And that new value is going to be based on common architectures that connect all of these things together, sensor to cloud, that interoperate not only within those vertical markets, uh, so not just within a specific industry or segment like energy, but really the real value of industrial IoT starts to become unlocked when we start breaking down those silos of information and sharing data across them. When our transportation infrastructure can talk to our energy infrastructure, we can do all kinds of cool things in terms of how do we manage the power grid based on where and when electric vehicles are deployed uh, throughout a particular geography. And that's a next level of interoperability that hasn't been available today. Um, to give you an idea of the, of the way that, that, that people are thinking, um, GE Healthcare is uh, a customer of ours, 
and they are thinking this way for their next generation of medical devices, connected intelligent medical devices in a hospital. If you look at this picture uh, in sort of the center right, you'll see a number of infusion pumps uh, mounted on a pole. Today, in today's world, none of those pumps talk to each other. They, they just sit there kind of dumbly doing their own little task, pumping in whatever happens to be in the bag attached to them into the patient. They're not connected to each other. They don't even know that they're all connected to the same patient. That is going to change, and that is GE Healthcare's vision for the future, that all of these devices should be able to collaborate and work together, know that they are connected to the same patient, and by, in, by doing so, we start to improve patient outcomes. Today, preventable human error is the third largest killer in the U.S., and it's largely because these devices don't talk to each other and they can't do things on their own. So we are entirely reliant on an overworked human somewhere in this loop looking at all the information that's coming back from all these disconnected devices and trying to make a decision in a moment of stress. And so industrial IoT really uh, is, is about making these devices smarter, making them work together, allowing them to care for a patient autonomously without the need for human intervention. Um, and as we have seen in the recent weeks, uh, that is going to become increasingly more important. The little diagram that you see in the middle with all the red boxes and the lines connected, this is their simulation. Uh, this is their view of a very small hospital, only about 300 beds. Uh, and this is essentially all of the beds and patient monitors and essentially what the network is going to look like. And as you can see, it's heavily interconnected. This is not just little siloed pieces of information and little independent networks. Um, this is a very, very big mesh. mesh. And this is what it takes uh, to realize the industrial internet of things. So for today's talk, um, we're going to talk about uh, an incredibly useful document that's put out by the Industrial Internet Consortium. It's a document called the Connectivity Framework, and it provides uh, recommendations for you as an IoT developer on how you should approach thinking about your networking and connectivity. In reviewing that document, we're going to talk about levels of interoperability. Um, we're going to talk about the difference between communications frameworks, communications transports, and communications protocols. And it's important to understand the distinction when you start focusing on interoperability um, and potentially interoperability with systems outside of just your own. And then we're going to take a look at, well, how do we take all that knowledge from the IIC and the recommendations of the connectivity framework uh, and how do we, in theory, choose a standard that gives us the level of interoperability that we want? And we'll take a look at sort of a theoretical approach, and then we'll actually walk through um, perhaps some real-world examples. And we'll take a look at some of the, the core frameworks that they recommend and, and try and map those maybe to a couple of uh, potential use cases. So how can we build uh, IIoT systems, industrial IoT systems? What's the architecture we should start with? And if you're sitting there as a designer saying, well, you know, where do I start? You know, I hear about all these different protocols and I go to riot meetings all the time and I learn about all these cool technologies that people have, but how do I really tell whether or not this is going to work for me? Um, well, the good news is you're not alone. There are hundreds and hundreds of companies that are in the exact same boat. And Many of them have joined, have created, uh, and joined this organization called the Industrial Internet Consortium. And today, it's, uh, it might be over 300 com member companies now at this point. Um, RTI is a member. Uh, we have been uh, involved with them uh, for quite a number of years. What's unique about the IIC is really they're the world's largest IoT consortium that's focused squarely in the industrial space. Um, and effectively, they created the industrial IoT market by providing a place where systems architects from all these different companies could come together and talk about issues like, hey, how are we going to make the energy system talk to the smart, inf you know, the, the smart city infrastructure, uh, talk to the smart transportation infrastructure? Because prior to this, there was no place where those people could sort of meet and compare notes and sort of agree on what standards to use so that we could realize this next level of interoperability to really unleash um, the true potential of the industrial internet. And so the IIC 
is an interesting organization. Um, I like the approach that they take in, in that they're not a standards body. Um, they're not like the IEEE or somebody like that. They are not looking to create new internet standards. They have a very pragmatic approach. Rather, what they are doing is they're saying, you know what, let's, let's do this. Let's survey what the existing technology is that's out there and available today. Let's pick some winners, essentially, and let's make recommendations for our membership based on solid evidence about whether this particular standard will help us realize our vision of a future interconnected industrial world with smart machines that can work together cooperatively. So I like the approach that they're not trying to create new standards. They're saying, what's the best practices and best technologies that are out there that are available today? And let's recommend those and provide our customers, our users, uh, members rather, with a roadmap. And so one of the documents that they uh, have published um, to do that is something that they call the Industrial Internet Connectivity Framework. Um, and the connectivity framework is actually a really, really usable document. Um, I have spent way too many hours in my life uh, reading protocol specifications and communication specifications for all kinds of different industries. Um, and most of them are uh, terribly intractable. Um, if you, don't ever ask me what I've been reading lately at a cocktail party. It's not, it's not, uh, not something that's particularly fun to listen to. Um, but the IICCF is, is a really usable document. It's actually fairly brief. Um, there's about 40 or 50 pages of meat, which we're going to cover today. And then in the appendix, there's a lot of informa uh, interesting information, real-world evaluations that you can use, and we'll talk about that. And so the approach of the document, uh, it starts off with basically saying, what kind of architecture are we trying to achieve? Um, and then based on those goals, what are the assessment criteria that we can use to look at existing standards? Um, and we'll talk about the assessment uh, criteria forms, uh, the templates in a bit. Um, and then what they've actually done is they've done a bit of the heavy lifting for you and have actually done the assessments on a number of existing technologies that are out there today, which sort of represent, you know, uh, best of breed, uh, best of class technologies that are available today. Uh, the document represents years of work um, by many of the top architects uh, in, across many industries. Uh, and it really sort of encompasses lots of different standards and technologies. And the goal really here, again, is to sort of break down those data silos that have typically kept perhaps one industry segment from communicating with another. So the goals of the connectivity framework document are really to bring clarity to your path, um, basically provide a, a guide map um, to what's out there. Uh, secondary goal is also for, to provide a long-term stable foundation. So basically, if you are a company and you are looking to develop your next generation product and you want to be sure that it's going to have a long run in the industrial IoT space and be able to interoperate with other systems from other people, uh, in that case, um, the IICF sets a good foundation for you. Uh, and then finally, um, we also want to have useful practical advice, right? It's nice to talk about things sort of in theory, but they actually went ahead and said, how do we make this useful today? How can somebody pick up this document this afternoon, have answers to questions that they can really use and go out and start making decisions on? Um, so those are sort of the three pillars, the three goals of, what, uh, of the connectivity framework document. One of the things that um, this document talks about is levels of interoperability. Um, and there's a great Wikipedia page on uh, the link on the bottom of the page there that talks about uh, conceptual interoperability. And so at the very lowest level, we have technical interoperability. And this is basically a sharing of opaque data. And in human terms, technical interoperability is, you know, I have a mouth and two ears and you have a mouth and two ears. So in theory, we should be able to communicate, but there's no guarantee that we're talking the same language or using the same words. We are just technically able to interoperate. I can make noise, you can hear it. We climb a little higher up the interoperability ladder and we get to syntactic interoperability. Our syntax 
is compatible. And now we're actually sharing a common data structure. In the human world, we share a language. We're both speaking English. Um, and so uh, much higher level of interoperability than just grunting and making noises at each other at the, the technical interoperability level. The next higher one up the chain uh, is semantic interoperability. And this is still very much in the R&D world of the computer space. Um, but this is basically where not only does the data have structure, but the data has context. And so we're both speaking English, but perhaps we're both trained in a particular field. And so we can have a discussion about, uh, I don't know, um, ARM Cortex and assembly language, because that's something that we both understand. Um, doctors, uh, you know, have a whole different set of semantics that they use when they talk about a patient. Um, and the semantics are important. Uh, because you can be using the same words and have to two totally different meanings if you come from a different semantic world. I do work uh, with RTI in both the energy space and the military space. And in the energy space, they have intelligent electronic devices in substations. And they refer to them as IEDs. That is a very different meaning and when I go and talk to my military customers and they talk about IEDs, which are uh, improvised explosive devices. Um, so the semantics are very important uh, when you're trying to interoperate clearly. So the technical interoperability level, again, you know, we sort of have this basic communications. We can share in the computing world bits and bytes back and forth together. But the communications at that level, the transport itself, really has no idea what that data we're sending is. Doesn't know, doesn't care. Um, and so really all it can do is get a message from point A to point B. If we go to uh, a, a connectivity uh, technology that gives us syntactic interoperability, now we have the ability to exchange actually data objects and they have a structure and they have a meaning and they're strongly typed. So we both agree um, about what the contents of that message are and it's unambiguous. Uh, and frequently that also means that that data structure can actually be discovered uh, dynamically at runtime. Somebody doesn't need to know it ahead of time. And as you can imagine, that makes your system uh, a lot more flexible and a lot easier to integrate new technologies into. And like I said, uh, you know, semantic interoperability, where basically different actors on the system can, can collaborate on the same data sort of automatically, that's really an area where there's a lot of R&D. Um, there's not a whole lot of off-the-shelf technology available today that gives you semantic interoperability uh, in the computer world, uh, but folks are starting to work on it. Um, so while we had that same data structure before that represented a temperature, now we know the difference between uh, this particular temperature is a patient, uh, part of the patient's vital statistics versus this particular temperature is information about his room uh, and, the, and the environmental conditions in it. Um, so an entirely different level of understanding. If we look at the evolution of anybody that's worked in the computer science world uh, for a while knows that we always have these different models of the network uh, stack. And when I first started in this world, um, there was a four layer internet model uh, that was uh, very, very simplified. Um, later on that evolved into a, the seven layer OSI model that most people in the business know of today. Um, the IIC uh, took a, a little slightly different look at it and um, with an eye towards these levels of, of interoperability. And uh, they came up with this um, new six layer IIoT connectivity stack. Uh, and this is what it looks like. Um, so with the lowest layers, you see things like a physical layer and a link layer. These are frequently lumped, lumped together. Uh, these are the things that really go down, like, you know, what's the actual transmission medium and, and how is the framing handled on that? When we get to the network layer, we start talking about some of the things that perhaps we're more familiar with, uh, things like packets. Um, and here we're re really talking about the IP layer. And the connectivity framework document that we're talking today doesn't really address these lower three. Um, those are fast moving areas, a lot of high risk in there. The IICF document uh, is really about focusing on software interoperability, and that's really the, the focus of these next two layers, the transport layer and the framework layer. 
And at the transport layer, again, we have uh, technical interoperability. We're able to transfer messages, but no syntactic interoperability. At the layer that the IIC calls the framework layer, now we're able to share uh, complete data items back and forth. And finally, up at the highest level, uh, at the information level, the semantics level, um, you know, that's really today sort of in the purview of the, the domain-specific applications that you're working on. If you're working on medical or energy or something like that, uh, you, you've sort of got your own framework uh, working up there. But um, the IIC connectivity framework document that we're going to be talking about today is really focused on these two levels and drawing a distinction between what is a transport and what is a framework and how can we best set the table for interoperability within a system and between systems to, again, enable the real value and potential of the industrial internet. So let's talk about the transport layer first. So um, exactly what is in there. So above this layer, we have technical interoperability. So I'm able to send a message, for instance, a, a sequence of bytes, um, but that is an opaque data stream. The transport doesn't know uh, what that data that I'm sending is. It doesn't know if it's patient information or a chunk of a movie from Netflix or a financial transaction. It doesn't know. Um, and so there's not much you can do with it beyond getting the bytes from point A to point B and hopefully not dropping any um, as it does it. Uh, it might have some limited uh, capability to do things like maybe a little bit of flow control or uh, traffic shaping. Um, but that's about it. And this type of thing, a transport, really should run on kind of any computing platform. So let's zoom into that and see what some of the components are in here. Uh, so at the core of this, we see some communication modes. And this would encompass uh, distribution patterns like unicast or multicast. Um, we might have simple ideas of addressing of endpoints like sockets, basic notion of connection, um, perhaps limited prioritization, timing, and synchronization. And here we have security at a very gross level, transport level security. And we're kind of taking an all or nothing approach to security, basically. Every message we send is kind of going to have the same security when we're using transport level security. So we're either encrypting nothing or encrypting everything. Um, and that's pretty much the limits of it. So this is useful for stringing devices together uh, and applications together, but it pushes a whole bunch of work and a whole bunch of risk up to the application layer uh, software, right? Because this doesn't know and understand any kind of data types uh, and can't keep track of them, uh, data objects, and it doesn't really hand handle things like uh, timing all that well. Uh, and security is at a very gross level, all of those responsibilities are pushed up into your application code. And once you start putting all of that application logic in to handle those lower level functions, now your application becomes very brittle and it tends to be very tightly bound to other applications in the system. And if one changes, they all have to change. And this is how we end up with siloed systems because there's, they're, they're so closely tied together that, um, you know, nobody wants to touch them or break them or share the data with anybody else, and it becomes very difficult for these systems to interoperate. So let's look at the next uh, higher level uh, as we move from uh, technical interoperability to syntactic interoperability. And this pushes us into the framework layer. And a connectivity framework will provide above this true syntactic interoperability. So now we are sharing structured data types, structured data objects between applications in our system. And uh, the framework provides a, an unambiguous, strongly typed data format for, for those objects. So we can be sure of exactly, you know, what format they're in when we share them, uh, regardless of our, you know, architecture or programming language uh, or under other uh, technology that we're using to write our program. Below the framework layer, we're handing off opaque data to a transport. Um, within the framework, we have much more control over things like data flows and security, and we'll see why in a second. 
And just like a transport should work on any uh, computing platform, a framework should as well, and it should be available in a wide number of programming environments uh, so that we have our best possible choices of computer languages for the development at hand. So let's zoom in a little bit to this framework layer and see the additional services that it offers over a transport. So frameworks, again, are designed to optimize the delivery of data structures rather than messages, right? Really focused on a much higher level of abstraction. So at the core of this layer is this box that you see called a data resource model. And um, this binds together uh, the shared data objects between the participants in the system. And to do so, this requires some way of identifying the data structures and telling one from the other. And so uh, the framework provides this notion of IDs and addressing so that I can tell data object A from data object B. Um, again, we're, we're looking at uh, 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 syntactic interoperability here. So we have a strong data type system so that we can clearly identify, you know, this is an integer versus this is a floating point value versus this is a string. Um, because the framework is keeping track of unique instances of our data structures, it has to have lifecycle management. And it exposes lifecycle management through uh, CRUD functions, just like a database, right? Create, read, update, and delete the data structures in my system. And then we have, uh, just to the right of that, some state management, which allows us to synchronize a common truth across the network and handle events like connections and disconnections of participants and perhaps uh, manage a history for each instance within the system. Those are all under the purview of state management. The aspects of state management are governed by the box just to the right of that, something called quality of service. Quality of service is what controls all the feeds and speeds within your system. So um, is the data delivered reliably or is it delivered best effort? Can I have multiple owners of the same data? Um, do I want to have redundant publishers of the same data? All of that is controlled by quality of service. Security at the framework layer is now not tied to the transport or the pipe, but rather it's tied to individual data objects. And this gives us much more fine-grained control over who in the system has access to what pieces of information. And that's a very big distinction between security at the framework layer versus security at the transport layer. And again, all of these are enabled through this common, through this, this idea of a data resource model and the ability of the connectivity framework to manage instances of individual data objects and provide a much higher level of abstraction to the applications sitting on top of this where they can interact with data rather than messages. You can interact with the data at this layer through a number of patterns. Um, so we might have patterns like pub sub uh, or request reply. There's a notion of discovery. So applications can discover each other and discover different data types in the system, what data objects are out there. Um, if our state management and quality of service can't handle a particular request within the system to provide data in a certain way, we might need exception handling. Uh, we well, not might need, we definitely need exception handling and, and a connectivity framework should provide that. Um, and finally, we need some data centric way of accessing the framework. And so we have an API, but the API is different in a framework, in a, connect, uh, in a connectivity framework than it is in a transport. In a transport, the API is very much focused on messages. Hey, send a message from, you know, to, to that computer. At the framework level, the API is different. It basically says, here's a piece of data. Here's uh, the patient's vital statistics. Uh, share it with whoever is interested. And so it's a much higher level API. Um, in terms of receiving data, you might say to a framework something like, I need to know about patients that are on this floor that are assigned to me as a doctor who've had a body temperature greater than 100 degrees within the last 24 hours. And when you find patients that meet that, Here's how I want you to tell me about them. Give me four updates a minute, no more and no less. And that's the kind of request that you can put into a connectivity framework versus a transport. 
So how do we begin to connect these systems? Um, you know, if we have uh, maybe some legacy systems out there, you know, in an ideal world, we'd all have a greenfield installation, right? We'd be able to create something new from scratch and not be beholden to all, all the bad decisions that, that those before us made. Um, but the reality of the world is that there are tons and tons of, you know, we live in a brownfield world. Um, there's tons and tons of existing t technologies and all kinds of different vertical markets, and there's all these data silos today. And so if you look at a system like that, let's say an arbitrary, you know, blue system, and we have these, uh, you know, the blue ovals or the applications in that system on the network that they're tied to, and we want to connect it to some other legacy system or maybe it's even a new system. Well, the approach that we take today is we string them up and we make a bridge between them. And that's okay if we're just connecting two systems, but then green comes along. We want to integrate green as well. And now we find we have to make more connections. And it doesn't take too long before we start getting a ridiculous amount of connections between these different systems. And it becomes very brittle and very difficult to maintain. And as a matter of fact, this, this, rat, this becomes an, an order of n squared problem where the problem grows exponentially with the number of new things that you're trying to connect to the system. Um, and this is what frankly has, uh, this, is, this approach is what's been holding us back for years. This is why today, despite the internet revolution, a lot of these systems don't talk to each other. This is why all those medical devices like infusion pumps that we mentioned earlier don't talk to other devices in the patient's room because we'd have to build too many different individual bridges. So how do we break out of this order of n squared problem? And here the IIC connectivity framework document provides us some recommendations. And basically what they said is that, listen, you know, there's not gonna be any one silver bullet. There's not gonna be one core protocol or connectivity framework that everybody can connect to. And if we just, everybody just bridges to that, then the world would be a great place. Because there's no one core connectivity framework that's going to meet the needs of all the different industries in the industrial IoT. So their solution is, was, you know, let's try and limit the problem space. Let's define three or four, or maybe a half a dozen connectivity, what they call connectivity core standards. And so um, that is what you see here with the big yellow, green, and red arrows. Uh, so these are a small handful of uh, selected connectivity core standards that uh, the IIC recommends. And by having only a few with off-the-shelf core gateways available that bridge between them, we have limited the problem space. So if you've got three connectivity core standards, you only need three bridges. And then our approach for other legacy systems, brownfield systems, other protocols that aren't one of these three, maybe you've got something that's based on a transport um, rather than a full framework, but you wanna get that in to a larger system and have it interoperate. Well, the answer there is that um, what you do is you take your existing technology and you bridge it to one of the, one of the three or four connectivity core standards. And now by doing so, you become immediately interoperable with anything else, not just on that standard, but with anything on the other core connectivity standards because we have standard bridges for those. And then uh, by extension, uh, if there's other bridges to those cores from other legacy technologies, now all of that stuff can interoperate. So uh, it's a sane, rational approach. We at RTI have seen this approach um, played out for years, uh, not just in the industrial space, but particularly in the aerospace and defense world, um, where people you know, bridge to our technology as sort of a, a connectivity core, and it, it makes all the integration um, of all their legacy stuff much easier. So let's talk about how do we find uh, the right technology for a core connectivity uh, option. Um, and to do that, the IIC provides uh, something called assessment templates, um, and we're gonna take a look at what those look like. So uh, the assessment template looks to answer some basic questions um, for a particular technology, right? So it asks questions like, well, which layers of the stack does it provide? Does it qualify as a transport? Or does it qualify as a framework? Uh, you know, can we use it there? Does it have a data resource model? 
Does it exchange objects or does it exchange messages? What core functions does it provide? Um, how does it rank against some of the uh, considerations and the, the qualities that we look for in a, in a core framework? Um, how does it impact the system architecture? Is it server or broker based? Is it peer to peer? Uh, those kinds of questions. Um, and ultimately, you know, again, we're trying to drive to this question of does it fit the criteria for a core standard? And we'll see what that criteria is in a little bit. It's actually a relatively short list uh, of about 10 main features. But what I find interesting about the templates is if you ask a bunch of engineers to sit in a room and, you know, make a, a spreadsheet of, you know, to compare two or three different communications protocols, they're going to come up with something that is very much focused on the technology side of it. Um, and if you ask their manager to do the same thing, he might come up with a completely different checklist that has a different set of considerations. What's nice about the IIC uh, CFs uh, templates is that they actually look at the world from four different view viewpoints. So there's the much, you know, more technical, more geeky for guys like me uh, implementation viewpoint where we actually start looking at, at you know, what are the technical implementations uh, that are being performed by this particular technology. Um, so a lot of great, you know, uh, technical meat down in the implementation viewpoint. But if we get to up here to the sort of system architect view, we start looking at the usage point and that, uh, the usage viewpoint, and that talks about things like architecture, um, security, gateways, safety. Uh, we have a business viewpoint, which talks about questions like, you know, is there a, an, an international standards body that's governing this standard? And is that standards body open, right? Is it an open standard? Can I join the standards body? Can I contribute to the standard? Can I help mold and shape that standard? Can I have an interest in that standard? It's something that the low level engineer is probably never going to care about, but that their manager or their company's management may very well care about, right? Because this is a business decision. What's the licensing model for this? Um, and so it's a very holistic view uh, when you take all these viewpoints together uh, for the assessment. Uh, like I said, I find it a very usable um, document uh, for comparing different technologies. Um, one of the really cool things that the folks at the IIC have done is that they've done the heavy lifting for us. Not only did they provide us this great template, they actually went out and looked at a, a bunch of uh, frameworks and transports that are out there today and ran them through the templates and summarized all that and captured all that. Um, and they found industry experts in each of these different things to do the assessments uh, and fill out the templates. And those are all captured in the appendices uh, or the appendix of the uh, IICF document. And that is a hugely helpful reference. Um, it really opened my eyes to a lot of technologies that maybe I only had a passing understanding of or things that maybe I thought I understood, but actually uh, after reading this, I realized, huh, that's, that's a, you know, perhaps a misconception that I had. Um, so that is a hugely valuable part of this document um, that they've already done this assessment. And so if you actually look on the left here, we have, you know, again, the IIC's uh, six layer model of the world. Um, and you can see how some different IoT technologies that perhaps you've heard about fall into their model and where do they fall? Uh, are they transports? Are they frameworks? So at the network level, we have, you know, the IIC has sort of said, listen, we're, we're focused on an IP based world. Um, and down at the link and physical layers, you know, again, we're sort of not worried about that level so much. This, the IICCF document is really about software interaction. And so we should, to some extent, be network link and physical layer uh, agnostic. It shouldn't really matter whether we're communicating IP over Ethernet or IP over 5G. It should all be transparent at the upper layers. But things get interesting here at the transport and framework layer. So at the transport layer, we see some of our old friends, TCP and UDP. Um, and we see some newer IoT technologies like CoAP and MQTT um, represented at that layer. We see, uh, again, another old friend, HTTP, um, which is a, a transport. And then we see four uh, communications frameworks uh, up here at the framework level. Um, on the right, uh, we see one called OPC, which uh, 
back in the day originally stand for Olay for process control. I'm not even sure what the O stands for these days. Um, but uh, OPC defines um, its own transport layer, this OPC UA bin uh, that runs over TCP. Um, but OPC really comes out of the manufacturing world, and that's still really kind of where it's at today. Uh, over on the left, you see a box called DDS, the stands for Data Distribution Service. Um, DDS has its own transport, this DDSI RTPS down in the green box. Uh, but DDS really runs over any transport. That, that RTPS transport runs, uh, in most cases, over UDP on a LAN uh, or over TCP if you're going across a wide area network. But this RTPS layer can actually run over low bandwidth satellite links. It can run over serial links, shared memory, backplanes. It's really below the RTPS level. It's really transport agnostic. Um, but it also has this upper level uh, framework where it can exchange uh, strongly typed data objects with other uh, applications in the system. 1M2M is a framework that doesn't provide its own transport, but it can use transports like CoAP and MQTT and HTTP under the hood. Um, and web services is not a specific standard, uh, but it refers to a collection of connectivity frameworks and libraries that are built on top of HTTP that typically used uh, a RESTful architecture. And this is pretty much what all your web applications today and mobile applications are built on. Um, and so those are sort of uh, some of the biggest names in, in IoT protocols, if you will, uh, mapped to the way that the IIC sees the world. Uh, and it does make a distinction between um, transports and frameworks. And it specifically calls out, you know, what should be the criteria to become a core framework, um, one of those three big arrows that we saw on the earlier slide. So let's see how some of these choices map to that. So these 10 criteria are basically uh, the criteria for becoming a core standard, a core connectivity framework from the IIC's perspective. Um, so again, at the framework level, we do need to provide syntactic interoperability. We have to have a strong standards body. Um, the, the technology needs to be horizontal. It can't be something out of just one industry. Uh, so again, you know, I work in the power industry. Um, they have some really nice data-centric frameworks in the power industry, but they only work for the power industry. Uh, you really can't use them outside of that. So they would be disqualified on account of that. Um, the technologies that you want to choose as a core connectivity framework should be stable and deployed. They should have off-the-shelf off the gateways available to other cores. Um, they should meet all the functional requirements and non-functional requirements, uh, all your illities. Uh, you should have a formal security model um, for that. It should not be based on any technology from any single vendor. It needs to be something that you can source from multiple places. We don't want anything proprietary as a core framework. Um, and you should have a choice of SDKs. You should have both commercial options and open source because you know, your business model may differ from another vendor's business model that's in the same space. Um, so these are four of those core connectivity frameworks and sort of which boxes they check um, within those. And we're gonna take a little deeper dive into some of these uh, a little bit later. Um, so what's the process you should follow when you're trying to decide, uh, you know, which technology you should use for your application? Uh, well, basically, start with the assessment templates, determine your system requirements, determine if you really need a, you know, a core connectivity framework, uh, or maybe you just need a bridge to one that's already there and you're going to use something a little lighter weight uh, because that's what's right for your application. Um, and that's pretty much the approach, you know, uh, try and pick where you should be on this drawing and build any gateways for, for things that you need to bridge into that. So if you were to sit down and try and basically uh, look at the requirements of your system and sort of plot those on a multi-axis graph, and I'm only going to show two axes here, but this could have, you know, maybe 10 different axes. Um, and then you were going to try and look at these different IoT technologies and say, well, how do, how do they map to that, right? And each one is going to 
overlay a different set of your requirements. Um, and ideally, uh, you know, your application is going to fall in a spot that overlaps one or more of these, so you have a choice. And that would be an ideal world. Uh, but the reality is it, it looks more like this, right? The, these core frameworks actually live in totally different sort of requirement spaces because they were really built for different types of applications. The needs for uh, real-time edge-connected device are very different than a web-connected service, as a for instance. And so the requirement overlaps are, are, are not there. They, they tend to live in very distinct spaces. And so your application, hopefully, it falls in or close to the requirement set of uh, the requirement mapping of, of one of these technologies. And if it, if it does, you know, choose the one that's closest and that's about the best you're going to get. And hopefully you're, you're, you're not out here in interstellar space where, you know, you just don't have a match to anything. Um, so how can we choose from those four technologies that we talked about a little bit earlier? Uh, so if you are a software architect, and you are interested in integrating components, right? You're building a very large scale architecture, something like GE's vision for connected healthcare. You really want to take a data centric approach where the interface between the devices and the components in your system is the data rather than messages. Um, then you want to look at a standard like DDS, which is entirely data centric. If you are a device manufacturer and you're making things like PLCs and sensors and, and smart motor drives and things like that that are going to be used in, let's say, a manufacturing environment and work cells, uh, and you are primarily selling to the technicians that install them, these are, you know, systems integrators, they're not software developers, you really want to take a device-centric view of the world and you want to look at a technology like OPC UA. And if you're building web applications uh, that you want to share data to a bunch of, you know, users on, uh, you know, uh, on the internet, maybe on mobile devices, and you're really sort of connecting back-end systems and you're trying to take that information and make things like dashboards, in that case, you want to look at web services and HTTP and you want to take this approach of, you know, a RESTful uh, architecture. And if you uh, are into ICT, if you know what that phrase means, this means a very specific thing to you. You're probably uh, like a wireless or a telecom uh, provider or integrator, and you're really focused on a common set of services for that type of world, right? You're worried about how do I bill customers uh, for their cellular usage or something like that. Um, or for their home automation system, you know, I want to charge them sort of by transaction or how much data uh, goes over their cellular connection. And in that case, you want to look at something like 1M to M. And so we're, uh, we got about 10 minutes left, so I just want to run through a couple of um, use cases uh, through some of these questions. Um, so I'm going to talk about DDS for a second, Data Distribution Service. Uh, my company, RTI, we sell an implementation of DDS uh, called Connects DDS Pro. DDS is an open standard. Um, there's a lot of different implementations out there, uh, but we are the market leader in it. But DDS is fundamentally different. DDS, again, is data-centric in nature. And if you look at some of these other technologies that are listed on the bottom here, things like TCP, sockets, MQTT, field bus, CAN bus, uh, queuing services, all of these are different in that um, they're all about messages. And that's a problem when you're trying to scale up. The data is an afterthought. All the communications in these systems is between entities. It's between clients and servers or queues, as opposed to focusing on the data that you want to share. DDS, by contrast, is different. The data is the interface between the applications. If all the applications agree on what patient data should look like, all they have to do is write patient data, request patient data, and that's what they get. They get the patient data locally as if it was there all along and it came from them themselves. It just sort of magically appears. Um, they don't have to worry about any of the messaging or connecting to a server or any of that. The data is just there natively. And it turns out that large-scale systems really are sort of all about the data. Um, you know, if you were to design something like a, a part system for an auto store or something, you wouldn't want to have to worry about the bits and bytes and how they're structured and stored on a disk. 
you use something like a database, which is an abstraction where the interface now becomes the data. The interface between your application and all the information about the parts that you're storing are, you know, exposed and abstracted away through the database. And while a database is about storing and searching old data, stuff that happened in the past, DDS gives you that same model, right? You interface with the data, but it's about data in the future. When you express an interest, when you put a query, if you will, into a DDS data bus, it's expressing an interest uh, for a specific set of data in the future. And that earlier healthcare example I used, I said, I'm a doctor and I wanna know about patients. I, I just walked onto the fourth floor of you know my local uh, uh, wake med hospital and I want to know in a moment tell me all of my patients on this floor that have you know vital statistics outside of this range right so I'm going to let the communications infrastructure essentially triage my my route for me and uh, you know pick the patients that I need to see right away so when should you choose DDS these are sort of five qualifying questions um, you know, if you're in the real time world, if you're concerned about things like milliseconds, microseconds, if you were looking to scale up your system, maybe today you only have a couple of programmers, but ultimately if you look at all of the things that your system connects to, where there'll be, you know, 10 or more programmers. And at that point, managing message communications between all of them, getting everybody to agree on message formats becomes very much of a headache. Agreeing on data is a much, much simpler paradigm um, and a much better way to design your system. And that's what DDS exposes for you. So if you say yes to three or more of these, then you should definitely be talking to RTI um, about DDS. Um, if you are making uh, devices, again, for something like a workstation, something like a PLC or an intelligent motor controller or a sensor or an actuator, that's gonna be used in that environment, um, and you think of the world as sort of device-centric and object-oriented, you probably wanna go with something like an OPC. Um, so again, here's sort of a set of qualifying questions about when you might wanna use a technology like that. Um, and if you say three or say yes to three or more of those, you might want to uh, use something like OPC. Um, because we're a little shy on time, I wanna skip ahead to Something that is not a connectivity framework. Um, this was one layer lower in that chart, right? MQTT is a transport. That's actually what the second T stands for. Um, it was originally designed for telemetry. How do I collect data from a large number of remote devices back to a central location? And for that task, it does really well. And I wanted to get to this example because this is actually a talk that I gave last year um, for a different Riot event. And a gentleman from the crowd, you know, we were going through this exercise and talking about all this, and he described his application, a very specific application. And I just remembered it last night as I was reviewing these slides. And he, he was making an application that basically counted people at places like a public park. And he said, listen, you know, I got these boxes, we're gonna put them up on a pole, they're gonna be battery powered, and you know, maybe once an hour, once every half hour. They're going to kind of power up and count people, you know, how many people are entering the park and send this information off periodically so that the folks running the parks can decide, you know, do I need to close this parking lot and open an overflow um, or something like that. And at the time we went through this Q&A thing, um, and these are the questions for MQTT, and he checked most of these. Um, you know, his application was primarily data collection. One sensor did not need to talk to another sensor. It was really all northbound communications from the sensor up to the cloud. He didn't care about interoperability with any other systems. This was a closed system that just the parks department would use. Um, he did have many small devices, again, little battery powered, uh, you know, infrared detectors to, to count people. Um, and software was a relatively minor challenge for him compared to how am I gonna get these things installed? How am I going to power them for long periods of time? How are they gonna communicate over wide distances from potentially remote locations? And so he checked um, pretty much all five of these questions as a yes at the time. And so MQTT made a lot of sense for him then. But I was thinking about that application last night and a lot has changed in the world since we gave that talk last year and, and we had that exchange. Um, so he's got now an infrared people sensor. And with the whole 
uh, COVID-19 scare, that particular sensor might have an entirely new and interesting application today and may flip the answers to some of these questions. You know, with an infrared sensor, you can look at people and detect their body temperature in addition to counting them. Um, so maybe now that sensor is going to talk to other things at the edge of the grid or at, at the edge of the uh, edge of the network. Maybe it's not just going to be used at parks. Maybe it's going to be used at things like gyms and grocery stores and other places to monitor people in live and in real time and detect uh, folks that have a temperature. So that second question is there little device to device communications may flip from a no to a yes. Interoperability now may become much more paramount because now he's just not communicating to some back end for the parks department to open and close parking lots once or twice a day. Now he may be in, have a need to interoperate with other parts of the healthcare system uh, and other systems and security and whatnot live and in real time. So interoperability may be a huge concern for him now, whereas it wasn't a year ago. Uh, and as a result of that, his software challenge may have gone up significantly. It might no longer be a minor software challenge. How is he going to integrate to all of these other systems may actually be a much, much larger challenge now. So if that same gentleman were to ask me that same question today, um, I might direct him away from a transport and more to one of those core connectivity frameworks for his particular application. It might make more sense to make his device um, able to interoperate and communicate with other devices in a real-time way uh, by leveraging a core connectivity framework. So that's a real-world example um, of, of how you can use these assessment questions that are in the core connectivity framework document uh, to make design decisions. Uh, understanding, of course, you know, design decisions can change over time. What might be true six, month, six months ago can be entirely different um, in the environment that we find ourselves in today. Um, so we started off talking about the disruption uh, that the IoT is going to bring to the world, particularly to the industrial space. Um, and again, the real value in it is a common architecture that connects sensor to cloud, interoperates between vendors, and spans different industries. And it allows all of these things to talk together. Um, we spoke at length about the IIC's uh, connectivity framework document. Uh, there's a link for it here. If you can't find it, uh, reach out to me directly and I'll be happy to get it to you. Uh, the document is free to go on and uh, go ahead and download from um, the IIC's website. RTI, like I said, we have an implementation of a core connectivity framework called DDS. Uh, you are free to go to our website, rti.com slash downloads and get yourself a free 30-day evaluation. Um, so I invite you to do that. Um, please follow RTI on all of our social media. Uh, you can find us on all the uh, all the latest and greatest. Um, and I invite you, of course, to uh, reach out to me directly if you have any questions on this talk. If you are here in the Triangle area, uh, I definitely invite you to reach out and let's connect. Uh, once we're all off of quarantine and we can go out, I am waiting for the day that I can go out and have a beer with some of you folks um, and see you all at a riot event. Uh, so please reach out to me. Uh, my email address is John B as in boy at rti.com. You can also find me on LinkedIn. And with that, Caroline, back to you. I'm sorry, we're a couple minutes over. No worries. Thank you so much, John. That was really great and informative. Um, we really appreciate that. Just see um, one question so far. Um, Caroline, there have can you hear me? Yep, got you now. Okay, thank you so much to everyone who joined. Um, we just have one question that I see um, so far. This one comes from Mike. There have been many recent discussions um, which revolve around older PLC devices coming on board the internet and immediately causing security problems because someone has taken what was an air gap, net gap device and placed it into a hacker prone world. The protection it's lost being offline is balanced by the value of access to these devices. What's being done at the protocol layer to protect devices which are not modern up-to-date devices? 
Yeah, it's a great question, Mike. Um, and you bring up a good point. A lot of these uh, industrial applications, power grid's another great example, where they have historically been air-gapped. They've been on, let's say, leased lines. Um, and that was essentially their protection. Nobody from the outside world could get to them. But as people start to move over to newer, newer technologies in places like the power industry, where they are now connecting substations to the public internet um, or through LTE connections and things like that, the equation changes drastically, as you rightly point out. Um, essentially, uh, you know, the IoT becomes the internet of targets um, for hackers because they can uh, basically now have access to all of these different things. And so there's a number of different approaches to security, and um, uh, I've actually given a talk on this for Riot as well, and maybe we'll, we'll drag that back out for another one of these virtual lunch and learns. But, you know, you can take the approach of the, the sort of system level approach to applying security where you're applying a bump in the wire or a firewall. Um, you can take the approach of let's start using transport level security, right? Just sort of encrypt everything in the pipe, and that's your sort of VPN access, that kind of thing. Um, or you can take the approach that a data, uh, one of the core connectivity frameworks offers you, and that is security at the data object level, very fine-grained security. And that's indeed the approach that um, CDS takes to it. And I will say that no one of those is a silver bullet. You need defense in depth. You need to have security at all of those different layers. Uh, so it's not a simple question uh, or not a simple answer to that question. Um, uh, and you are right. A hundred percent, Mike, it's a huge problem of people just bringing stuff onto the internet willy-nilly and not thinking about the security implement implementations of it. Thank you, John. Um, we actually have a question from another John. Any comments on selection of hardware and software to support communications and time sync flash stamp? So, um, Time syncing and time stamping uh, are two entirely different things. Um, and some of those questions are orthogonal to the question of which connectivity framework should you use for your system, right? There, there is some time syncing that can happen at much lower layers um, within that stack. So if we go back to uh, pictures of the stack. Oops. Find a better picture. So if we look down at the link in the physical layer, um, you know, we have technologies like TSM, for instance, which will give us uh, time synchronization um, down to, you know, tens to hundreds of nanoseconds across a network between different actors. And that's great for doing things like direct industrial control um, when you can sync up like that. Not all applications need that. Some some applications have looser notions of synchronization, you know, plus or minus a couple hundred milliseconds instead of nanoseconds. For those, they might approach synchronization at a higher level, perhaps something uh, at the network transport, maybe even framework layer, and that's where you start looking at things like uh, PTP, precision time protocol. Um, for time stamping, um, there are a lot of different approaches. I mean, some of that is tied to your underlying operating system. Certainly in the case of uh, some real-time operating systems and things like that, they have very fine-grained uh, operating system clocks that they can provide you information with. Those, of course, uh, can be either sort of relative, right, it's just a free-running counter, or they can be tied to some real-world time base, an external GPS uh, receiver, something like that. Um, that type of application um, for timing is typically used in the military, typically used in power grid. Um, where that you know they they, they go with uh, time stamping from uh, um, from a GPS system, so there's a lot of different approaches to it. It really depends on what your needs are and what kind of temporal requirements you're trying to meet. Um, I don't know if there's a simple answer to that one as well. Uh, there's a lot of technology out there, um, and it's kind of orthogonal to this question about how do we develop different kinds of interoperability. Thank you, John. Uh, we'll take one last question. This one is from Bill. Are there any models that use gateways to re remediate risk of legacy systems like ICS slash OT systems? 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, those gateways can be used. So, so one of the hallmarks, for instance, of um, the core connectivity uh, technologies, right, um, the core connectivity frameworks, is that they do have a fine-grained security model. So by definition, you know, communications that are happening on these inner layers, the big arrows, um, tends to be more secure than what you have out here at the fringe in your legacy ICS systems. And so you might have a non-secure ICS system here, and by bridging it into a core connectivity framework, here you can apply a fine-grained um, security model. So, um, you know, within this legacy system, there may be no control in there that says, okay, uh, only, you know, this PLC can send that command. Um, but that's the kind of thing that you can enforce once you get it into this uh, central layer. Uh, again, because a core connectivity framework has this notion of security that's built on individual data items rather than a transport. And so it allows you to, to layer on top of a legacy system a much more fine-grained uh, security control. Great, thank you so much, John. Um, thank you for everyone who joined us today. Uh, this session was recorded and will be posted on Riot's YouTube channel. Um, thanks again to John um, for joining us and you can reach out to John at johnb at rti.com or I'm happy to connect you to him as well. He just put his um, email up on that last slide there. So, um, and one last note, John will be hosting a different Lunch and Learn in May, so please, Come back and join us for that. Thank you so much, John. Yep, sure thing. Thanks, everybody. Everybody stay healthy.